And boom, we are back for another episode of AlphaCast. My name's Mike Winner. I'm here as always with Dr. Bear Paul Lando up here on the beautiful Smith River in the great state of Jefferson, enjoying our fall into winter as harvest is over. And uh, we are focusing now on building out new content for you guys. Uh, we will have a lot more content for the co-op. If you are interested in supporting Alpha Vedic, we highly recommend joining the co-op at patreon.com forward slash Alpha Vedic. You can also join us on Telegram at t.me forward slash Alpha Vedic or Discord at alphavedic.com forward slash Discord. We are all about building community and collaborating and cooperating in a new decentralized system so we can bring the change we all want to see. How about that? So today we have someone I've been really looking forward to talking to. Tom Campbell um, is the author of the My Big Toe trilogy that unifies science and philosophy, physics and metaphysics, mind and matter, purpose and meaning, the normal and the paranormal. The attributes assigned by some theologians to their concept of God are very similar to the attributes of the, L <clears throat> the LCS, the larger consciousness system is scientifically derived by Tom. The next big cultural and scientific paradigm shift is virtual reality, as Tom has said over a decade, for over a decade. Virtual reality is now a more widely accepted concept in science and technology. Tom combines a fundamental understanding of consciousness and virtual reality to back up this prediction with a logically and scientifically derived my big toe theory. The theory explains most of the remaining big questions in both physics, and metaphysics. Tom's model of consciousness derives quantum mechanics and relativity, relativity, eliminates quantum weirdness, and builds a scientific foundation under much of what was previously deemed quote-unquote paranormal. This comprehensive logical and scientific explanation of both objective and subjective reality perfectly defines a big toe, or theory of everything. A former NASA uh, physicist, Tom worked as a large complex systems analyst by day and collected evidential information in the larger consciousness system by night. Tom delivers information through his unique abilities and experiences that you will not find anywhere else. And going uh, into other realms is something that has always fascinated me, something I've always said, if people want to know what the reality is all about, go do the work yourself. Figure out how to get out of body. It's a real thing. I've had experiences doing it myself, and it is um, what true science is all about. How are you doing today, Dr. Bear Paul Lando? Doing great. Thank you, Michael. And uh, Tom, it's so great for you to make time for us today, and it's uh, really an honor to have you here. So thank you. Uh, you know, I really enjoy hearing about your journey, and you know, I've listened to some of your podcasts, and, and I feel even though we don't know each other, we're kind of kindred spirits in a certain way. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I did my own journey through medicine. And after my conventional training, I felt like I had some good foundation, but there's just a lot of missing parts. And especially when I got out in practice, uh, things didn't really work the way I wanted to, uh, you know, things to uh, work, you know, with clients. And, and uh, it led me to um, explore different avenues, uh, you know, what some people call alternative. And I started with Chinese medicine and homeopathy. And what I found is, uh, you know, uh, parallel course with my metaphysical studies is that these people thousands of years ago were not only just talking about things, but had a practical application and way to measure things, you know, real practical systems. And so that was my segue, I guess, into a whole different world these days. Uh, we have um, a community, worldwide community, where we measure with instrumentation and so forth, uh, what we'll call the qualitative side of uh, science. And, you know, when I listen to you, and I know we're going to learn more from you directly today, uh, you know, I, I like to term science as more of an integrative science. I believe that's the, the way it uh, needs to go. You know, we apply uh, these principles to soil science here. We have a, you know, off-grid permaculture farm. Uh, you know, we're still doing a lot of research in medicine, so it's uh, marvelous to, to uh, just hear about your journey and, and with your background and credentials, and you've really covered both sides of the equation yourself, so um, we can start it off wherever you like there, and, uh, but just glad to have you here. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity of coming here and chatting with you. 
Um, that, uh, you know, information is good, but shared information is even better. So uh, an opportunity to share some information, uh, I'm thankful for that. So thanks for inviting me. You know, you mentioned uh, that uh, if you go back, what, uh, 2,000 years to 3,000 years, you find that uh, people seem to have a pretty good understanding of the nature of reality and how the world worked. And that's because though it's very, very expensive and difficult to explore outer space, exploring inner space just takes time. And, you know, if you're a human being and you've got some time, you can explore inner space. And when you explore that inner space, you'll find answers. You'll find, you know, in, information that helps you, what, deal with life, deal with reality. You know, you understand the why and, and the how of, of reality a lot better. So people have had the time to do this, uh, you know, for a long, long time. You know, I guess the image for me comes up of Buddha sitting under the, under the tree, you know, uh, contemplating the, the nature of reality. And uh, suddenly uh, an aha moment came and he had it. Well, he had the time to sit under a tree and contemplate. And so have others. So the, the kind of the wisdom that we here in the 21st century are beginning to dig up has been around for a long, long, long time. We are just kind of restating it in our own language, in terms that, uh, and metaphors that mean things to us. That we have to, you know, every, every I shouldn't say generation, but um, you know, every once in a while you have to restate in terms of the metaphors and the vocabulary and the, and the knowledge of the people of your time. Otherwise, the old poetry gets hard to understand, you know? So, you know, you can read the Bhagavad Gita and, uh, you know, for if you happen to be a, a left brain science guy, you get through about five, 10 pages and say, what, this is about some guy in a chariot in a war? What's that all about? Doesn't make any sense, you know? So you quit reading it because you don't understand, you know, you don't have enough knowledge for it to make sense to you. So that's how, that's why we have to reinterpret because we have to bring everybody else along with it. So, you know, I'm a guy that's had one foot in, in physics and one foot in consciousness research for, you know, what, 40 years probably with the physics as a professional physicist. And now I'm retired, but, you know, all that same amount of time, I started my consciousness research career and my physics career all in about the same, you know, the same time within probably three or four months of each other. So, uh, yeah, it's been a long, uh, it's been a long, strange, uh, wonderful journey. And, <laughs> and now I have an opportunity to, you know, to share some of the insights and some of the knowledge gained during that journey. And I'm just having a really good time with it. It's just a lot of fun. So, it, well, and it, it is fun. <clears throat> and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, the valuable role that you play for all of us is, um, you know, just, uh, let's just say lending sub subtitles to old metaphysical studies so that it is accessible to the Western mind. Mm -hmm. and, and just like the Eastern hemisphere of the earth at one time was more the, the keepers of the old ancient knowledge in the Western world were more than just the manifestation on a physical plane. And we're seeing the two hemispheres come together now for uh, integration. And just like on an individual level, a lot of us are getting the message that uh, it's time to integrate the two hemispheres and work with a whole brain rather than just one half. So Michael, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry about that. Oh, no, I, um, that you just hit the nail on the head right there. What I was kind of going towards, which was where I feel like we're in a space right now going into 2021 where we can kind of, as you were saying, integrate the West and the East in a way that I, I feel like could be more powerful than the last you know few thousand years because of our connectivity on a global scale. We are what we're doing right now. I mean, we're projecting out these thoughts to thousands of people all over the globe via this technology. So it's really empowering and it's exciting times. And I hope people are excited about this time. And one thing I've noticed in being involved in the 
consciousness music festival scene over the last 10 years, which is which really erupted in California with a lot of these really cool festivals where kids aren't going just to rage and do drugs. They're going to do yoga and meditate and 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 connect and really mess around and play with their consciousness, which is really exciting. So I, I, I was asked, I just wanted to ask Tom, do you do you feel like we're moving into an era of new consciousness exploration? And are you yourself still pushing those boundaries of your own exploration into your consciousness? Yes and yes. Those are the short answers, but I can elaborate <laughs> a little bit. Please do. Uh, we, uh, hum humanity, we human beings, we've been around as Homo sapiens for about 200,000 years. And in that time, you know, we're, the purpose that we've had here all this time is to evolve the quality of our consciousness. And that means become love, cooperate, care, um, make it about other, not just about self. You know, this is our goal. This is our purpose. And we've been working on that consciousness evolution, becoming love for 200,000 years as a species. And we haven't made a whole lot of progress. We've made some progress. If you look, the world is a much kinder, gentler, uh, nicer place now than it was, say, 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago in general. You know, if you look at most people, most of the time, life is a lot better. We've made progress. But one of the interesting things is about evolution is that, you know, th the, more, the more you change or the more you evolve, the easier it is to evolve more. As you evolve, your system becomes more capable, more flexible, more complex. And as it does that, its ability to grow, then also, you know, the potential for that growth becomes greater and greater. So what we have is evolution is very, very slow at the beginning, evolution of consciousness, this growing up thing. But as you make progress, you make progress faster. And then it goes faster and faster. So the process accelerates. So it looks something like this. You start off with a curve that's very, like my finger here, very slow, goes up a little, up a little, up, up, and goes. That's, that's the way it works, okay? And we are just now at that part that's starting to go up. And for the first time in the history of humanity, we have the potential to take some big steps forward in consciousness quality, in caring, in cooperation, in working together, in you know, things that matter, like relationship, you know, other people, connections. This is, we can take some big steps here. And I would agree with Mike that the, the core, um, let's say, thing that is, that is making this possible now that it wasn't before is technology. As Mike says, there's the technology we have today is the, is the key ingredient that wasn't there before. And what that technology does is instead of, you know, there's always been people, as we said, that, that um, have had time to figure out the nature of reality, and they've created little bubbles. You know, you can call those little bubbles of enlightenment. And they've popped up all through the ages. You know, every age has had its people that have understood and have little bubbles of enlightenment. That's sort of what you guys are doing out in the woods. You're trying to create a little bubble of enlightenment out there, you know, that uh, you know finds uh, better ways of doing things and better ways of thinking. So we got these little bubbles of enlightenment all over the place and always have for thousands of years, but they stay localized. They don't expand. I mean, they expand a bit right around the local area. You know, Buddha had a whole bunch of people came around him and they learned and so on. And now it's a Buddhism is a big thing with millions of people, but it's still in the margins. It's not mainstream. Okay, well, today, what is mainstream has a lot to do with science. The, I call the, the scientists, the high priests of Western culture, and the reason I call them that is the, 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 the job of the high priest is to tell everybody else what to believe, what's true and what's not. That's what the high priests do. Well, what, five or six hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, those high priests were all religious. 
high priests, and they told the people what to believe. Well, we've passed that point now. It's the scientists are now the high priests. They tell people what to believe. They're the ones that define mainstream. So before, mainstream was defined by religion, but there was all sorts of competing religions. So there was a lot of confusion as to, well, yeah, that's what they believe, and that's what they believe, but how do you know? You know, Well, science kind of fixes that. There's just science. There's not like this shade of science and that shade of science and, you know, all these other kinds of sciences, and you really don't know which one's really science. There is this science. And science uh, is supposed to work on facts. It's supposed to work on experiments. And the people believe what the scientists say. So science now just, you know, def uh, defines mainstream. And because we have technology, the world information-wise is a much smaller place than it used to be. It's still physically the same size, but as far as information goes, it's not much bigger than a medium-sized community. People everywhere on this globe see what's happening, share ideas, deal with concepts, and they do it within days, even within minutes and hours. You know, it's like we're doing right now. We're sharing this all over the place. And it's going to go out and be on YouTube. And it'll sit on YouTube. And 10 years later, there'll be, you know, 300,000 views from all over the planet. So that's different. Now, I think the, the key thing here is that physics is going to be the thing that kicks this this change. I say we have this chance to make some big progress. And physics is going to be the thing that kicks that off. And they've been kind of stuttering around with it for about 100 years. About 100 years ago, we had the, the inception of quantum physics, quantum mechanics, with the double slit experiment. And at that point, science knew that materialism wasn't the right answer because double slit just tells you that it's, it doesn't follow a material, you know, uh, logic. It goes beyond a materialist logic. But science has been very uncomfortable with that. They don't like that. They're still stuck back in Newton's day with the great clockwork universe. You know, that's where science is. They've never really moved on because Though they were excited back in the 1920s about this new idea and something other than materialism, they didn't know what to do with it. They couldn't take the next step. They didn't have any logic to derive it. It was just the result of the experiment. Okay, now, so what's the theory? Why, does it, why is it like that? You know, what's the overall picture? Well, they didn't have an overall picture. The only picture they had was the one Newton handed them, plus they were able to do calculations in quantum physics and get right answers, but they didn't understand it. So they called it weird science. They didn't call it science that's logical. All the rest of science is logical, but quantum physics is weird science. <laughs> it's weird because it doesn't follow materialism. So instead of continuing to search for that understanding, instead they took the easy, the easy road out, which was oh, it's just weird science. It's always going to be weird science. It's something we'll never know. It's just one of those things nature never intended for people to find out. We just have to deal with it as weird science. There is no answer. We just accept it as weird science and stop looking for you know, a theory behind it. So they did. So after 20 or 30 years of banging their heads against that wall, they finally gave up and said, it's just weird science. Nobody will ever know. Let's go on. And they kind of stopped looking for an answer. Well, now the, you know, the quantum mechanics has grown and grown. And they've, instead of doing just the double slit, now there's a hundred experiments that all say the same thing. It's not materialistic, you know, it's information. Information is what's important. That's what reality is built out of. It's built out of information. Double slit told them that when they realized that the experimenter, what the experimenter knew, changed the results of the experimenter, of the experiment. 
You see, the, the person looks at the which way data, which is, you know, which slit the particle goes through, and you get one answer. They don't look at it, you get a different answer. So why does what the experimenter know change the nature of reality? You see, that was what double slit brought. Well, now they've done similar experiments uh, um, that aren't just double slit, but a whole bunch of experiments, and they all say the same thing, and that is, this reality is information based. Matter of fact, I was listening to a, a video of some guys over uh, that were looking at the, the, uh, at the big uh, uh, atom smasher over in CERN. Remember back, oh, about six or seven years ago when the, the God particle, the Higgs oh, yeah. boson was, was a big deal. The hydrogen and, collider. Yeah, yeah. So they were, so they were over there and they were being interviewed and I, I was listening to this interview, and this part of it just jumped out at me because it's so obviously true. And that the scientists there were saying, look, um, you know, we don't really think of the electron anymore as a piece of mass with a charge. That's the way we used to think of it, but that doesn't work. We can't use that information and, co and compute right answers. We think of an electron as a point with the attributes of mass and the attributes of charge. Well, you see, attributes are just information. So they think of, of the electron as information. And with that, they can compute the right answers with their quantum physics to predict what the results of those atoms smashing together are going to produce. So what we've had now is, is that physicists probably a pretty large minority of physicists say that our reality is information based because physics has just been telling them now for about a hundred years that that's the way it is. Well, they don't really know what to do with that. See, they're right back where they were back in the 1920s after Einstein and Bohr and Heisenberg and Wigner and all those guys, uh, you know, came up with the double slit experiment. They know that it's information based but they don't know what to do about that. Okay, so it's information based. Now what, you know, where does that take us? What's the theory? So it's the same sort of place, but now you see, we have a, a concept that we didn't have back in the twenties, a concept called virtual reality. It didn't exist back there. We know now about realities that are information based. And we realize that when you say it's information-based, that is logically equivalent to say it can be computed. And saying that it can be computed is logically, you know, connected to, or is a logical equivalent to, you know, a computer can produce it. Well, that's a simulation. And simulations are virtual realities. That's the way it is. Well, if this is information based and our reality is computed, then we live in a virtual reality. And though now a, a lot of physicists, a lot of young physicists, the old physicists are still stuck back in Newton's day, but a lot of the younger physicists realize that that's just a fact here. I mean, mm -hmm. their physics tells them that we live in this virtual reality, but they don't know what to make of it. So, Look at virtual reality and it'll tell you what to make of it. How does virtual reality work? All virtual realities have a few things in common. One thing is they have to be computed. So you need a computer. And that computer has to be non-physical from the viewpoint inside the virtual reality. So if you're the elf in a virtual reality, then that computer can't be in elf land. It has to be non-physical to the elf outside of the virtual reality, right? Because the virtual reality doesn't compute itself. It has to be computed somewhere else outside the reality. Okay, so that's one point. The other point is that all virtual realities have to have players. There has to be a reason for a virtual reality. They just don't spontaneously, virtual realities don't just erupt, you know? They need a purpose. And their purpose is that they have players that play the avatars that are in the virtual reality. By definition, virtual realities make avatars. Okay. Now the player and the computer have to communicate with each other. 
they have to be in the same reality frame. And they both have to be non-physical to the viewpoint from inside the virtual reality. So where does that leave us? Now we apply that to us, whatever you have. You have us, our bodies aren't really us, our bodies are just the avatar, mm -hmm. a computation. We are consciousness, the choice maker. That's what the player does. The player makes choices for its avatar. So the computer computes, the, and this computer has to be in the same reality as the player. The player is consciousness making our choices. That computer is also consciousness. It's in that same reality frame. So I posit a larger consciousness system, which is all of consciousness. It's an information system. Well, that makes sense because what are you conscious of? You're conscious only of information, right? Your sense data, that's what you're conscious of. So consciousness is information. And we have this big information system and part of it configures itself as a computer. And part of it takes chips of itself or pieces of itself, subsets of itself, and calls those individuated units of consciousness. That's the player. That's you and Mike and me and all the rest of the people and dogs and cats and horses and everything else out there that's conscious. That's what we are. We're individuated units of consciousness. So we're part of the whole. There yeah, is just this one thing and we're part of it. Go ahead, yeah, Mike. I was going to say you're kind of getting to um, the grand concept of most mysticism, which is this idea of whatever you want to call it, um, the ether, the, the source, the, <clears throat> the, um, the mana, the, this idea that there is this overriding essence of reality that uh, everything springs from, right? And exactly. some will call that God, some will call that uh, source, uh, which is a popular way to mention it these days. And uh, my question is, well, and one thing with quantum physics, we see that space doesn't matter, right? That you can instantly have something, you know, where you have mm -hmm. two of the same particles at the same time in totally different right. ass places. Um, so my question is, how can we, I think everyone in Alpha Vedic land gets this and understands this, uh, which is really cool. That's why we love our community. Tom, how can we start uh, applying this knowledge in more practical sense to apply the change we want to see right now in the world? Okay. And, and um, sorry to propel the conversation to this level, but it's yeah. like, I uh, feel like we're in a place now where we can start going there, you know? We can. So anyway, yeah, I was going there. I'm just slow. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm making a slow, a slow pass, but people have to understand kind of the nature so, of reality so it makes sense. So, all right. Yes, you're right. So now we have consciousness is the one thing that is real. Everything else is virtual. We're a piece of consciousness. You know, consciousness uh, doesn't die. Consciousness is immortal. Avatars die and so on. We can go through all of that. And we have purpose that I mentioned. Purpose is to, is to evolve the quality of consciousness. And that's done because consciousness is an information system. That evolution is done by lowering the entropy of consciousness. That is taking random bits and turning them into something that is meaningful, significant. Entropy is a measure of, of disorder. So you have all random bits in the system. It evolves by making order out of those random bits, calls that information, and then evolves from there. All right, so all this ties together. Now, here we are in the 21st century. We have an internet. We have, you know, the, now we can, everybody's netted together. Big ideas can fly and reach huge audiences very quickly. How do we get in the mainstream? Science now defines the mainstream. Okay, science is coming to the conclusion that this is a virtual reality. They don't take the next step, but the next logical step is then that this is a computed virtual reality. Consciousness is the computer, okay? And we bodies are the avatar. Now, when we do this, when, when, the, when the physicists say, yea, verily, this reality is a virtual reality. When they say that, they won't want to go any further than that. 
but the rest of the world isn't going to let them stop there. The rest of the world is going to say, okay, it's a virtual reality. You're the scientist. You know, that's a fact now. That's not a theory. That's a fact because science says that's the way it is. So where's the computer? Who's the programmer? You see, the rest of the world is going to ask these big questions and physicists are going to say, well, well, we don't know. We don't want to go there. We just say it's a virtual reality, but everybody else will want to go there. And at that point, we're in mainstream now with these ideas that have always been in a little you know, bubbles of enlightenment elsewhere. Mainstream. Physicists have told us that there is something non-physical to us that is our source. Because that's the statement, that's the logical, you know, that, that's the logical conclusion of this is a virtual reality. The logical conclusion is there's something non-physical to us that is our source. And at this point, people are going to start to wonder, well, if that's a fact, it's not that this is somebody's theory or somebody's religion. This is science telling us this is the way it is. So where is that computer? And if we are not ready for this moment, we're going to end up with uh, a lot of people trying to fill that power vacuum now that suddenly got opened with, oh, my God's a better programmer than your God, you know, this sort of nonsense. Mm -hmm. We're going to get that kind of struggle. But if we are to the point of understanding, then we'll get that. and We'll say, yes, there is something bigger. There is a spiritual component to us. There is something that is more fundamental than this physical world. And then all sorts of possibilities come around. Now, once you understand that consciousness is the computer and that we are pieces of consciousness, the player, which again is just logical consequence of this being a virtual reality, you also then must come to the conclusion that love is the answer. Now, that'll seem immediately that that's a big step, but I can, I can make that a, a shorter step. See, love is the answer. What's our purpose? Why are we here? What's the point? And that's to evolve the quality of our consciousness. You see, consciousness is an information system. An information system evolves by lowering its entropy. Okay. Now, we are a social system. All these individual units of consciousness make a social system. How does a social system lower its entropy? It does that through cooperation and caring and making it about other. That's how social systems lower their entropy. So why are we here? Well, consciousness just is a, is a thing that communicates. It talks. It makes choices, right? So it, it communicates with each other. That's what it is. And it's supposed to lower its entropy. And it got to the point where it wasn't growing very quickly. So it created a lot of individuated units of consciousness, which gave it more potential room to grow into. Wow, look, what could you do with all these free will consciousness interacting with each other? Well, it was supposed, what can you do? That's a social system. Okay, what you can do is cooperate and care, but just a bunch of consciousness in a big chat room talking to each other doesn't have much choices at any consequence. So evolution is slow. So the larger system source says, well, I'll take a part of my system, be a computer, I'll make a virtual reality with a really tight rule set that defines every interaction, every interaction, every time energy changes someplace, I'm gonna define it with my rule set. Now you have a place where there are consequences. You see the rules create consequences. So you create a virtual reality, get your individuated units of consciousness to go make choices for avatars, and suddenly it's not just chit-chat in a room, it's life and death choices. It's stay alive choices, survival choices, caring choices, help or hurt. You know, what can I take? What can I give? You got all of these choices, and now you have a virtual reality, which I call an entropy reduction entropy reduction trainer and consciousness is playing in this entropy reduction trainer in order to evolve the quality of its consciousness because with consciousness it's either evolve or die if you increase your entropy more chaos right you get to the point that all your bits are random 
no information, information system's dead. Or you can lower your entropy and create more and more meaningful information, configure what you have, the resources you have in more meaningful ways, and now there's more information and more potential and more ways that you can evolve. So the system needs to evolve its consciousness. It needs to lower its entropy. And I just make a, a, a string of synonyms out of lowering your entropy, raising the quality of your consciousness, and becoming love. All of those mean the same thing. So now that gives us a nice picture of where we are. So what does this have to do with technology? Well, if enough people understand this idea, which is in totally, it's totally inclusive, it excludes no one. All people with all ideas, you know, can fit into this group, can find themselves in this kind of a model. You know, if you're an atheist, you can say, aha, yeah, I knew it. There is no God. There's just this larger conscious system. That's the source. Okay. And if you're a theist, you can say, ah, I knew it all along. You know, we have this, this aware consciousness that's the source. So everybody can, can kind of find this the system. It doesn't matter whether you are, a, you know, a Sufi or a Buddhist or, you know, a Gnostic, whatever, or many of the uh, indigenous people, you know, with those old cultures that have these, these, these old ideas like uh, Australia Bushmen, uh, they live in the dream. And when you die, you know, then, then you get to the real world, you know, and this worm's a dream world. You know, Buddha said this world was an illusion. You know, so all of that gets collected, and yes, 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 they, they all can find themselves in this one understanding that's very uh, inclusive of everybody. So if we have this sort of thing and this understanding, there are no beliefs required. Matter of fact, belief is the enemy. Believing anything is a risk. Always stay skeptical of everything. You know, this is science. This is a logical progression. Now, it doesn't sound like science when I talk about it in a, you know, an hour or two hours. It's just not my, I can't do derivations here. But it really is a logically based thing. It starts from the beginning and just log, deductive logic, you know, comes out with this as the, you know, the model. This is a logical model. Well, the I ironic thing too, Tom, is that current Western, well, basically science right now is a belief system. It is a belief system. It's, it believes in materialism. And, you know, that is, you know, they've painted themselves into this corner, and the corner doesn't have the answer. You know, the answer isn't in, the, isn't in that space. If you are a materialist, you also have to be a determinist. You know, this is a big machine. Reality is a big machine, and all machines are deterministic. So... The big clockwork universe is a materialist universe. If, you're a, if you are a determinist and a materialist, you have to state that time doesn't exist. Time is an illusion. You know, and you'll find physicists saying that. Oh, all, you know, the past, the future, present, it's all the same. It all happens at the same time. Time's an illusion. Nonsense. But you have to say that if you're a scientist and a materialist and a determinist, because when you're a determinist, there's no change. Change defines time. If there's no change, then there's no time, you see. So nothing changes, then time is undefined. It it's, uh, doesn't exist. So if you're a materialist, you have no time and you have no consciousness because there can be no choices. If you're a determinist, it means there are no choices. Everything's determined. And there can be no free will because there's no choice to have free will for. So if you're a materialist, then you're a determinist. And you have to say that free will and consciousness and time are all illusions. On the other hand, if you take the opposite corner and you say, well, there, there is, you know, consciousness does exist and time does exist and free will does exist, then you look at determinism and materialism, and you say, oh, they're just illusions. So you see, we have these two opposite corners. One's time, free will, consciousness. The other one is materialism and determinism. And each one logically has to see the other as illusionary. 
Okay, well, and what is what does your experience tell you? Do, are you conscious? <laughs> Do you make choices? Do you have free will? I mean, what's what's your fundamental experience tell you? Which which of those is true? You see, and it's pretty obvious that determinism is a bad idea because it it it's the null set. It doesn't go anywhere. It just is. Period. It doesn't change. It doesn't grow. It doesn't evolve. It doesn't become. It just is with no purpose and no point. Well, that's not logical. That's irrational. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So I think now we are at a spot where technology, the internet specifically, is going to go together with the physicists. And I see this as a, this great big rock on the top of the hill, but the rock's in a divot. And the physicists there have these big crowbars and they're trying to get this rock to go. And when they finally get that rock off out of that divot and it starts to roll down that hill, that's virtual reality. That's when the physicists say, yes, this is a virtual reality. And after that, stuff's just going to happen. <laughs> Where's the computer? Who's the programmer? What in the heck is going on? What? This non-physical thing is true after all? That's what religions and spiritual practices and you know, mysticism have been saying all along, and now we find out that's the truth. Well, that's going to change everything. And in an environment where we're all together communicating, it's not going to be in a bubble. It's going to be all of us. And if we all get to this idea that we are consciousness and we are here to care, we're here to evolve, we're here to love, we're here to ask, what can I give, not how much can I take? And if we get that idea, I can see that humanity can make a giant step forward in just a matter of decades. You know, three or four or five decades, we can make a huge step forward. Well, here we are in that curve of evolution, and now we're starting to get faster and faster, and that can go very quickly, even though for 200,000 years, we're still in the, what, the warlord mentality, right? It's all control, power, force. That's the that's kind of the, you know, the, the, the way our, our, that's the way we organize ourselves with control, power, and force. And that can end. And I think we're coming to that nexus well, of all these things yeah, where yeah. we're going to see a great leap forward. And I, I think when science gets to the point where they realize there is a qualitative side, and, you know, you mentioned love, love is uh, an obvious force in nature. You know, I spent a lifetime studying biological systems and, and uh, observing that love is the ultimate um, entropy reduction, uh, you know, method at the cellular level. And, uh, you know, people that um, harbor any emotions other than love get disease. And so mm -hmm. that's something that a lot of us can observe. We can observe society at large when there's a lack of love and cooperation. You have chaos, you have devolution instead of evolution. And um, so when science can measure love, which I believe is possible, uh, you know, I think that's where we're, uh, you know, going to get somewhere. So do you have any thoughts on the possibility of doing that? Yeah, absolutely. You see, I, I define love as the nature of a low entropy consciousness. That's, that's love. So it's an entropy measurement. And I see right now people like yourselves and thousands of others who are coming to these same conclusions in their own way on their own path. It's everywhere. You know, you have biology, you have uh, uh, Bruce Lipton talking about, uh, you know, your, your genetics are not a, a prison, you know, that you're stuck in. Your mind modifies those, those, uh, those genetics. And we have, um, what's his name, a uh, fellow that's from uh, computer science and uh, uh, neuroscience, Hoffman, Donald Hoffman. And he says that uh, this reality is a, is a GUI. A GUI, you know, a, a graphical interface that we are something else behind it. You know, reality is behind the screen. Well, that's like the Buddha. This is an illusion, is what he's saying. You know, and he's coming from neuroscience. And we have lots and lots of people who have come to the same conclusion that love is indeed the answer. That's the key thing. It's relationship, the quality of those relationships. 
You know, nobody ever was lying on their deathbed saying, gee, I wish I had worked another day. You know, I mean, you're lying on your deathbed, you're thinking about, gee, I wish I spent more time in relationships because that's what's important, you know? So, yeah, a lot of people are getting that. That's why I say in the next maybe two or three decades or four decades, I don't know, we're going to have that big ball start rolling down that hill. And when we do, if we're ready, you know, if there's enough people listening to you, you know, and your podcasts and your stuff and me and thousands of other people who are who are at this point now, I think we're ready to make that turn and say, yeah, OK, virtual reality. You know, the well, source is consciousness. That's the only that's the only answer that makes sense, that the source is consciousness. That's the only thing that logically connects all the dots. And if we get to that, love is the answer is just a simple logical trip of, you know, this is consciousness is a social system. And it's easy to prove that social systems will do more, you know, will optimize the social system relative to their resources if they all cooperate and care. I mean, that's a trivial thing to, to show. So you know, the logic is all just laying out there. So yes, and as, ma as many ways as we can push on this, the better. You guys are doing your part. You're, it's the same message. I mean, it's not the same message in the details, but where we're going with it is exactly the same message. And that's true with lots and lots of people these days. So I think the system, that larger consciousness system, is trying to get enough people thinking along these lines so that when that rock starts down that hill, we're not going to end up, my God's a better programmer than your God. All that kind of nonsense won't take hold. Well, people will try it, but it won't take hold. There will be a larger group of people that says, not nah, been there, done that. We don't we don't need to go that route. There's a better, more open, more inclusive way to think about this. And in that case, I see a big jump forward in the near future. And yes, we couldn't do it without technology. Technology makes it possible. It finally gets us out of the little local bubble into a world bubble. You know, we're all here yes. in, this, in this same bubble. And that's what technology is doing for us. So yeah, it's there. And yeah, there's lots of people that are part of this process, part of the part of the solution. And well, you know, well, one thing we always say, Tom, is humanity, us, we are the greatest technology. And like Moore's law of exponential growth, we're seeing that. And it's and so my hope is that we, as you say, we hit that in the next. I hope it's even faster than three year deck. I'd like to see it in the next few years. <laughs> call me an extreme optimist, but, but seriously, the Moore's law idea, right. Of extreme exponential growth that we mm -hmm. see in technology, we are the greatest technology in my opinion. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we could see it happen a lot faster than I would say, even in the next like three, four decades. Uh, personally, I, yeah. I just see it happening. I, I feel, and I feel like we're being pushed that way right now with everything that's happening with the current situation I, on the planet. I agree. Yeah. I agree. We're yeah, being, a, we are being pushed that way. Go there's ahead. a lot of entropy salesmen out there. So uh, I think we better do something uh, quick so we don't have to suffer the consequences of the simulation. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting, but I, th I think really, uh, I don't look at outer events as chaos and negative. I look at it as a wake up call. And I, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I started this journey a long time ago, as I know you did. And uh, I see more people waking up, having different conversations more than ever. And it's very gratifying. And I think as long as you don't watch television, uh, you can stay in a very positive uh, frame of mind and knowing that the change is happening and there's no way to stop it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the no way to stop it is, a, is, a, is, is very true in that even if we go backwards, even if we do something really foolish, make poor decisions, we do get into the my God's a better programmer than your God, uh, you know, food fight. Even if we go that way, we will turn around and go back the other way because evolution is relentless. This is the forward, you know, play. The forward arrow of evolution is toward love is the answer. And we will get there sooner or later because 
whether we go backwards a few steps or not, that era of evolution is just going to keep chugging down that path, that direction. And absolutely, I know for certain, we will get there one day. We will live on this planet, you know, as a family, as a, as a, uh, you know, a cooperative caring species. That's in our future. Absolutely. The thing is, how long is that going to take? You know, uh, you know, yes, it could take as short as a, you know, three or four or five years. That's possible. I generally am not that optimistic. I am an optimist, but uh, I think I'm being optimist when I'm saying a couple of decades, you know, at the, at the least. Uh, oh, you know. oh, I agree. I, what I mean by, by that, I mean kind of consensus of moving of in the next three or four years, more and more of the mainstream coming to conclusions that we have already, that you have already, that mm -hmm. that becoming more mainstream in the idea of it, not the actual implementation, the actual change, but the fact that yeah. we're, and we're already seeing it, simulation theory is thrown around everywhere. Yes. So, uh, you know, so it, it's become very mainstream in that sense. And people with movies like The Matrix, right, and stuff, people are really right. having that, that framework to understand that. Now, I bring up The Matrix for a reason. You, this is something that's always interests me. You say there's a machine and we're in this virtual reality and that we have these definite rules that we have to play by. Is it possible as we evolve and as we get more in tune with like what Bob Monroe did at the Institute and actually teaching practical ways to go out of body and play mm -hmm. with the, with the non um, physical realities? Can we become the programmers of the virtual reality ourselves and actually manipulate the rules? Um, probably not in the way you're thinking, but we can we can do certainly a whole lot more than what we're doing now. Let me put it in a little in a little um, different way. The virtual reality has a rule set, and that rule set will probably stay very much the way it is as the rule set, okay? Because that rule set has to be very finely uh, tuned in order for this physical universe to exist and be stable. You know, you, if you change that rule set very much, you end up with a non-stable virtual reality. Uh, you know, there's a couple of, you know, constants that they, they look at them and they say, well, if, even if these constants were changed just in a tenth decimal place, the whole universe would have collapsed or blown up or, you know, we wouldn't have this reality. So the basic rule set, which is physics, chemistry, biology, you know, that's what science does. They dig out the rules of the rule set. Well, that's going to mostly change. But what you can do within those rules is going to grow immensely. And the reason for that is that we, consciousness, have two fundamental ways of processing information. One of those ways is intellectual. It's one way, okay? Like, that's your intellect. It uses logic. Logic is the tool. Okay, so you have, your, you have your intellectual side and your logic is the tool. The other side is intuitive. Okay, and intuitive is beyond logic. It doesn't have logic. It doesn't have a, a, a set of you know, steps you get to. You just get the information. It's intuitive. Now, that intuitive side is just as accurate and just as reliable as that intellectual side with its logic. It's just that we've never developed it. You know, we, we, you know, we spend, what, 50 years of our life honing our intellectual side and our logical side. Oh, we're good at that. But we deny mostly even that we have an intuitive side. And if we do, we find it unreliable. We don't depend on it. So we don't work with it. But when we, we will work with it, this is the point you're getting. When we get to that point where we have the bigger picture and we realize that the other half of our ability to work with information is intuitive and start working with that side, we will find that all the things that are now paranormal are just normal. These are things that we can use. Those are things that we can use to enrich our life, to help us be better at giving and loving and caring. There's information out there that's available. There's databases out there that are required for the rendering engine to make this virtual reality. And we can get into those databases. You know, now Buddha called those databases the Akashic Records, but you know, they're just databases. And I can show that they are required for the rendering engine. And we're consciousness, they're in consciousness. We can sort that data. 
But we don't get it logically. We don't get it in sentences. We get it intuitively in chunks. And with practice, those chunks become very reliable and very accurate. So remote viewing, uh, telepathy, um, you know, getting information about people, you know, connecting with them emotionally, understanding where they are emotionally, what their feelings are, what's important to them. All of that is there. It's all this information. Um, you know, when people see auras, they're just getting data out of the database. Remote viewing is getting data out of the database. And we have this other thing in our reality that says that we can modify future probability with our intent. So there is this future probability that the system needs to know to be ready to compute on the fly, this virtual reality, and we can modify those probabilities with our intent. That's why we have a placebo effect. You know, that's why positive thinking, you know, creates positive results and negative thinking creates negative results. We have intention. That's why most illnesses are because of negativity. The negative mind, mind leads, the body follows. The negative mind then creates a dysfun you know, dysfunctional mind, creates a dysfunctional body. And most illnesses can be healed if you have that positive mind. If you, can, if you can get that mind focused on the healing, then all the things that need to happen to heal tend to take place. So the mind is a powerful tool that we don't use much. And the rule set will say the rule set will stay about the same, but what we can do and how we can interact with each other and how we can affect things here, that can change a great deal. But that doesn't mean the rule set needs to change. It just means that we need to harness that intuitive side and take advantage of that. Now, if we take advantage of it for our ego, and because we want to control other people, well, that has a very, you know, that doesn't work very well. It's that kind of self-destructs. It doesn't uh, function. Oh, you can function. You can be a big, a big fish in a small pond, you know, so you can be the, you know, the, the, the voodoo guy with a bunch of, uh, you know, people who don't understand and you can scare them and create problems for them. But, Basically, you can't be very strong and you're not going to be very powerful as long as you're working on the negative side. It's just a very limited side that doesn't go very far and is self-destructive. So we will go through all kinds of things there too. We'll have you know, dysfunctional people using their intent for dysfunctional things, but that'll all work its way out again with evolution. That'll, that'll fix it. So yes, it will be a different place in the way we interact. Telepathy will be common. We do that now. We just don't recognize it. We're all interacting with each other all the time. We just don't know. How many times have you thought about somebody you haven't talked to for 15 years and you think about them and then within a couple of days, the phone rings and they call you up, you know? It's just, uh, it's the way it is. It's easy to do. Yeah, I teach courses in that. I teach people how to remote view and talk telepathy, you know, telepathy, talk to dead people, you know, all those sorts of things, you can do that. And you can do it very accurately. And you can do it when you want to get the material you need and have a lot of confidence in it. But that takes effort. It's not easy. You now using your intellect well and being logical isn't easy either. You know, that's something we, we work at, but uh, you can do it. It's a, well, it's a real interesting thing there. You're talking about personal responsibility and not externalizing your issues, externalizing the world, but going it within and doing the work, which is what I always talk about, doing the personal work. Before we can have this global community, we all, each, we're all a node, right, in the network. And, if, yeah. and, it, and in order for the network to work appropriately, each node has to be doing its part. And so one thing I loved about reading Bob Monroe's books when I was in high school, because I got really into the out-of-body stuff, is that it was very practical, very pragmatic. It wasn't like a spiritual text. It was just like very Western-minded, mm -hmm. just like, oh, all of a sudden I'm slipping out of my body. What the heck is going on here? Let's figure this out. And it became mm -hmm. like um, a, a fun experiment, right? And I guess I'm getting it.
and this is a good segue is so that some of our audience can start to learn how to do this stuff is when your own practice, you came from a very scientific mind in college. And then you, what did you learn about? You learned about meditation. And that was kind of your entryway, right? Into a lot of this practice. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we could just give some pract practical advice to people listening, going, how can I start doing this? What is in your mind, the best way to get start going into this stuff and then so that they could be prepped and ready if they are in that space of mind and, and heart to start doing this stuff because not everybody's ready to start doing this it's, everyone's on a different path but what in your and i have a feeling you're going to say meditation but what's the best way to start really getting into this and then how can we start moving forward into those coursework that you provide so that we can start playing with our consciousness more because i feel like that's paramount for everybody now mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll give a, a short uh, um, a view of this, or a, a very quick view of it, and then I can tell them some resources they can use where they can get a whole lot more detail. Fantastic. Um, yes, meditation is a piece of it, but it's not the whole piece. Meditation gives you one of the attributes that's necessary, and that is you have to be able to quiet your mind. If you have a mind that's constantly running full of thoughts, you know, things that are going on, oh, what, what am I going to have for dinner? What should I do next? What's on my schedule? And then your mind's just constantly yammering away. Then you're not going to be successful at with your intuition because you keep interrupting yourself. Every time your intellect takes charge, your intuition stops. These things work like one at a time, if you if you like. So you, if your mind keeps running, then your intuition is constantly interrupted. So quiet mind, and we get that through meditation. That's the whole point of learning to meditate is that you can sit quietly uh, in that what I call the day car moment, right? I, I think, therefore I am. The only thing you are aware of is that you am, you know, I am, I exist, that's it. You're not having anything else going on in your mind other than the fact that you exist. So that is training your, your mind to settle down and be able to be quiet and listen and be aware. So that's just one thing you need to learn. The other thing you need to learn, particularly in our culture, particularly among people who are left-brained and logical process-oriented, you have to learn to let the intellect go. We have a habit in our world of leading with our intellect. Anything comes up, our intellect immediately jumps up front, you know, assesses it, vets it, decides, you know, what it can do with that or what it can't do with that and what value it is. And all of that's intellectual analysis, judging, comparing, all of that stuff will stop an intuitive process. So you need to let that go. And that is probably the harder thing for people to do than really to learn to meditate, is to let that intellect sit down and be quiet, just be still, open your mind and accept what comes there without your intellect jumping in front, trying to assess it, analyze it, judge it, compare it, and, and uh, work with it. People who are left brain have a very hard time with that. If you're right brain, well, that's what makes you right brain. You're already sort of like that. You're already intuitive. And that becomes, you know, it's a lot easier for you to do that. But if you're not, and in our culture, you know, we, re we reward left brain kind of thinking, logical thinking, and we make fun of right brain thinking. We call those people airheads and space cadets and things like that uh, because they seem to be out of it, you know. They don't do logical process, but yet those people who are out of it can come up with conclusions and answers often much quicker than we do because they see bigger pictures. They don't have to get there through logical process. So what? So that's the second thing, okay? You need to get that intellect to just sit down and be quiet. Real hard problem for the left-brainers. Now, if you can do that, the rest of it is easy and just takes a little practice. So those are just the two things. It's a really easy thing to do. You know, you talk about going out of body. Well, out of body is a very poor name. You're not in your body. Your body is an avatar. It's computed. It's just information. It doesn't even exist. Your consciousness, you're already out of your body. 
All you need to do is switch data streams. So you're getting a data stream from the computer that defines this reality. Well, pick up another data stream that's defining some other reality in some other place. And there you are in that reality. Well, we do that naturally when we dream. When we dream at night, we're getting data from another data stream. It's not defining this physical reality. It's defining some other reality. And nobody has a big trouble dreaming. It's not like, oh, gee, dreaming. I've been working on dreaming for decades and can't seem to do it. You know, and people just dream. It's natural. Going out of body is easy, too. All you do is just switch data streams. But now you say, well, that sounds easy, but I know it isn't that easy. The reason it isn't that easy is you say, well, how do I switch a data stream? And as soon as you say that, your intellect wants to try to figure that out. It says, well, tell me the you know, tell me the steps and I'll do it. Well, the intellect wants to get in charge of that process. As soon as the intellect gets in charge of the process, the process is dead. It isn't going to work. So you see the problem there with that, with that intellect. The intellect wants to solve the problem, but in solving the problem, it makes the problem impossible to solve. That's its, that's its problem. So you get to the point that you can just be in that meditation state, open, empty, and then have an intent. Intent is the motive force in consciousness. When you have an intent, let's say a piece of information, you want to know, maybe you're remote viewing, and you want to know what's going on, you know, back someplace else. Somebody maybe you know lives on someplace else, and you can call them up and ask them. So you just want to check it out. So you just open your mind, and you uh, have an intention to get that information. You may get it in pictures, you may get it in other ways but you just open it. And the first thing that comes to your mind is the best thing, because in consciousness, the, 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 the searching the database is a thousand, maybe a million times faster than it is in searching, searching Google. Google takes about a second to come back with your answers. It's only microseconds, you know, that, that before you get the answer back from consciousness query. So a lot of people aren't even aware they just, that's just noise in their mind. They're not empty. So noise in their mind, they're used to that. They just, you know, push it aside, push it aside. So they can't get the information because it's just like all the rest of the noise in their mind and they push it aside. So you have that clear mind and you instantly get something, then that's it. Now, in the beginning, it's hard to get all the detail, just like it is in the beginning with your intellect. It's hard to, you know, take really big bites you need to take small bites. So do your remote viewing, not just in the whole thing, but look at attributes of the thing. You know, what are the colors? What are the dominant colors? Uh, what is it? You know, does it have an odor? Does it have a sound? Does it, uh, you know, is it happy? Is it sad? You go through all of these things you can think, you know, write down, you know, 20 or 30 questions like that and ask each one of them. And then when you're done, then go check the source and see how well you did. And you'll probably find out that you got 60, 70% of all the attribute things, but you didn't necessarily get the big picture. Well, that's because you're not real good at it yet. You know, it takes practice to get good at it. So you, you know, it's easy to do remote viewing because you Google remote viewing targets. If you Google that, you'll get a half a dozen sites that will give you remote viewing targets. And what these are, you'll get a number, usually a five or six digit number. Each number has a picture associated with it. You get the number, you remote view, what's the picture associated with this number? And then you type the number into your computer and up comes the picture, the truth data. So it makes it really, really easy to practice remote viewing. You know, all you need is a cell phone or a, you know, a smartphone or a computer and you have an endless amount of targets that take you oh, zero, cool. zero time to, to get, you know, so, so that helps, but do it with, you know, when you look at that picture, you know, what does it smell like? What does it feel like? Is it big and expansive or is it small and detailed? Just all these questions, happy, sad, like you may hear children giggling. Well, write that down. Happy children giggling. Who knows what that means? Maybe it's a birthday party, you know, maybe it's kids at a circus. You don't know what it's going to be, but just write everything down and don't try to make sense of it. Your intellect is going to want to try to name it. 
don't name it because that lets your intellect get in charge. And when as soon as your intellect gets in charge, it's gone. So just take the data and put it down. Well, I feel like there's lines going like this. So I'll just put lines like that on my paper. And now I see there's a circle over here. All right, there's a zigzaggy thing down there. Just do that. Don't try to say, now, what does that look like? Oh, it doesn't look like anything. It's garbage. I'm just getting garbage. See, that's your intellect. Mm -hmm. Just put it down. Do it. And then later, look at it, and you'll be surprised. Oh, that circle. Yeah, that was that's that the water tower that was right over there. And that zigzaggy line. Yeah, that's that road going up that mountain. And, you know, and things will start to make sense. But eventually, you can get to the point that you can see the whole big picture more easily. But you got to start small with the details. So that's a way to, to do that. Now, out of body isn't so magic. We're already out of our body. Out of body is mostly a, a single player virtual reality game. Okay, this physical reality is a multiplayer virtual reality game. Out of body is a single player virtual reality game, right? There's consciousness that's real. Everything else is virtual. In fact, anything that involves experience, anything that's experiential is virtual. Experience requires Rules. Experience requires context in which the experience makes sense, in which the experience is experience. Is it's context based. Well, the context is offered by the rules. See, rules create the context for which experience can happen. You know, uh, you know if we just say, "Okay, let's play a game, guys." Uh, you and you know Mike and and Byer and I, let's just play a game. Go ahead, your turn. Go. See, you don't know what to do because there's no rules. If there's no rules, there's no context. Without, without the rules, there's no experience. There's no interaction. There's no strategy. There's no way to relate. It's just nothing. So, so you have uh, virtual realities are where all the experiences. So when you're having an experience and out of body, you're just a different virtual reality, you see. And that's just another data stream from the larger consciousness system. And that data stream is going to give you experiences and lets you see and hear and feel and have conversations that will be meaningful for you if you understand them. Most dreams are like that too. They're meaningful to you if you pay attention to them. The system's trying to educate us and giving us choices everywhere because that's the name of the game. Make choices and by those choices you evolve. But Tom, so, those, uh, on, on those realms that you go to, those are objectively real places. Those aren't just a subjective, more kind of real dream, right? Isn't the idea that you're potentially going to these other virtual realities that others can experience at the same time, other individuated consciousness, whether it be your friend that goes that you could meet, like you tell the story of you doing this with your son, right? When you, yeah. and so and I, I've read a lot on this and I understand that there's other realities that are collectively controlled consciousness realities where all the people form that reality together. Right. Um, so I guess my point is these virtual, I, I, you know, a lot of people believe, well, that's just your own dream. That's just a trippy dream. But I think it's mm -hmm. important to understand these are have objective rule sets that others can experience the same because they have an objective reality to themselves. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes, yeah, some are like that. Some are not like that. Some are just an individual game for you, and other people will get a game that is designed to help them learn. Mm -hmm. You know, in their own way, and they're not going to get in your same game. I guess I should say it this way: there is nothing more real than information. Information is as real as it gets. Okay, so. When you get a data stream, that data stream defines your reality. You interpret that data to be your reality. And whether that's a dream or whether it's this physical reality, you get data, you interpret it as that reality, period. Now, I, I've gone to a lot of other virtual realities that have very tight rule sets like this one. So they, they, they feel physical. You know, the, the rule set's tight, so it's, it's a physical kind of reality. Now, that physical reality is there because the system doesn't have all its eggs in one basket. You know, it's got multiple realities going on, evolving. Uh, so you could go to that reality and you would see the same kind of creatures I see. Okay, if yes. you go to that reality, because that's a thing that the system has going. 
but you can also go out of body, get a data stream from the system that's there to help you learn, and that's just yours. Somebody else goes, they're going to get a different data stream. They're not necessarily going to see the same stuff. So that that out, you know, don't think of of the of the larger consciousness space like thinking of Chicago and New York. You know, they're places that exist and they are a certain way, and everybody that goes there will see the same thing. It's information. Everybody interprets that information differently. You interpret it based on your own history, your beliefs, your fears your knowledge, your lack of knowledge, all of that goes into your interpretation. So everybody sees a little different reality. Now, if it's a multiplayer game, now you have shared stuff, right? You both see the same table that's in the room. It's a multiplayer game. That's different. If it's a single player game, then it's just yours. And all the other people and characters and critters in there are NPCs. It's something that the computer puts in there because they're part of your learning process. So you see, if you're in one, then yes, if you're in like that, that uh, other reality that's more physical, yes, you and I could go to the same thing. I've been out of body, uh, took my son out of body. I went out of body with Dennis Menerick, the guy that I was working with out of Bob's. And we went out on an adventure and went out of body and saw the same things, interacted with each other. That was a two-player game. Mm-hmm. See, and you can have maybe three or four player games, but mostly they're one player, they're one player games. And this idea that when you get out of body, your first thing you'll do is turn around and look and see your body lying in a bed. That's because you believe that you're in your body. You're not in your body. But if you believe you are, then that's where you're going to be. You're going to be in your bedroom, you know, probably floating up and you're going to look down and see your body. But that's that's, I've, had, I've had that experience and yeah. I snapped right back in. <laughs> yeah, that's because you have a belief that you're getting out of your body. That's why you do that. If you don't have that belief, then you don't necessarily see your body on the way out. You just go. It's, it's instant. So, you know, when I say that it's just as simple as, as switching data streams, and that's as simple as just an intent, that means once you get once you really understand, you can be out of body in, in tenths of a second. It's just a shift with your intent. It's not a thing that takes time to do. And eventually, your reality, as you get more into the intuitive space and into the consciousness space, your, your own personal decision space grows and you start living in a bigger reality. You don't live just in the physical reality. You, re- you live in a reality that's bigger than just physical stuff. You guys do that now. You know, your reality is more than just the physical stuff in it. You connect with people. You understand. You have feelings with those people. You know how they're feeling and what they're thinking and who they are and what they are. And you, you, know, you care for them. And you have a lot of things going on that aren't just physical. You have physical and non-physical stuff going on all the time. And that just deepens and broadens as, you know, the more you go down this path, it gets to where that, you know, you tend to live at the being level and only go out to that intellect when you need it. So Tom, um, beyond intent, how important is purpose, uh, you know, as far as determining the success of your experimentation, for instance, just doing it for the pure pureness of discovery versus an ego desire to experience phenomena. Purpose is very important. And I break that purpose into uh, several categories. The best of all purposes is that you want to learn, you want to grow, you want to evolve the quality of your consciousness. If that's your purpose, then you'll go a lot faster and it will be more meaningful to you. You'll understand a lot quicker. The, the next best thing is that you're curious. You want to prove to yourself that this larger reality indeed does exist. And it is like, you know, you know, and what it's like and how it works. And you're just curious. That would be like the second best. If you go on, if we go on downhill to one that's not so good, your, your ego says, wow, powers. I'd like to have those powers. Jeez. I'd like to remote view the ladies' locker room. That would be cool. You know, you just want to do things because 
Yeah. I want to see the future lotto ticket. Yeah, I want to see the future lotto ticket, right? Things like that. And those are very ineffective. You know, they're, they're not on your, that's not on the fast path to going anywhere at all. And then, of course, below that is one even worse, which is I want to use it to manipulate. I want to use it to hurt. I want to use it, to, you know, send, send me $100 a month or I'll make your children sick. You know, I'll, I'll, use a, I'll use my mind to create illness, which is a possibility too. you know, change probability with your mind and you can misuse it as well. It's a tool. So that would be the worst possible thing. So there's, are, yes. are there universal laws, though, that protect consciousness or in, in general from that uh, manifesting? Yes, there's some. Um, you know, there's, there's several rules about this virtual reality. One is that entities outside the virtual reality only get to come here and interact in very limited ways. Um, that's... You know, so there's a bunch of rules about that. So, you know, you can't have a, an effective schoolhouse, you know, particularly like ours, you know, elementary school. You know, you can't have a bunch of, you know, five-year-olds and have, you know, the, 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 the high schoolers running through the halls and running through the classrooms. That doesn't work. So we got rules like that. And the basic rule is, though, that the fact that intellect and ego and beliefs get in the way if you're motivated from intellect and ego and beliefs, they get in the way. <laughs> they slow you down. So if what you want to do is manipulate your boss into giving you a raise, well, you can use your mind to, to put, plant that thought in his head. But at the same time, you're going to plant a thought in his head that you are untrustworthy, that you're a sneaky kind of person, and you're devious, and you're going to plant that in his head, too. You see, so it, so say it, it sows the seeds of its own destruction. So yes, you can plant something in the boss's head. Yeah, give me a raise. You know, I deserve a raise more than the other people in the office. And the boss will have that thought, but he'll also think, yeah, but that guy, Tom, he, he's, uh, he's just a little sneaky. I don't know that I trust him so much. You see, so. Well, it's the same way in physical reality. If you're sneaking around, like trying to do shortcuts, you'll end up paying in the end, right? And, right, exactly. <laughs> There's a price to pay for all of that, for all of that stuff. And the, of course, the biggest price is that if if what you're doing is shaking people down with threats because you know how to use your mind to make them sick or ill or do something nasty to them, you're de evolving. You're on a path of de evolution, and the more you de evolve the less power you're going to have, you know, you're, 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 you're heading in the wrong direction. So that's kind of the, at the outer level, that's, that's the big problem. You keep de-evolving and de-evolving and pretty soon, you know, you uh, uh, can't do anything. Tom, have you ever had experiences with negative entities? I know when I was in high school and slipping out of, out of body and having these experiences, I had a weird experience that kind of shook me to the core where I felt there was a presence in my parents' bathroom and I was there and I was struggling and like kind of battling with this like kind of heavy force. Mm -hmm. And it came down to my will finally to, to overcome this force, to push it out of the house. It was like, I had to put everything in my entire being and know that I, that I am truth and love and that I could you know, say be gone kind of thing. And then it mm -hmm. left and it left me exhausted and really kind of frazzled. And I was like, what was that? Because it definitely felt like kind of a dark force. And maybe a psychologist will say that was me battling my own demons, but it felt like it was a, a, a third party presence. Have you ever had any oh, of those yes. experiences? I've been through all of that too. That's, that's what young men get into when they're young and they're doing these kinds of things. That's kind of a typical thing. But mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, I would agree with the psychologist to a large extent. What happens is that here you can you can use your intent to create by changing probabilities. Now it doesn't mean you get anything you want. It just means you can change probabilities. Okay, but when you're in the non-physical, when you're not in this rule set, when you're out of body, the rule set's a lot looser. There's a lot other things you can do, and your intent starts to manifest things. It starts to create things. Whereas here, that's not 
here it might take months and months to create something with an intent there it takes you know seconds to create things and if you are fearful oh i'm in a strange place how do i know the strange place isn't hostile you know this is we're not in kansas anymore and i have no idea whether there's boogeyman out there or what and uh, that will create a boogeyman just like that. You'll have one. And then it's going to be, oh, what am I going to do with this thing? And then it's a matter of, of will. And some of that I call fear tests because the system does try to keep people out of the outer body who are very fearful. Because if you're very fearful, you will get terrified there. And if you get terrified there, then you're worse off than you were before you ever went. So it's actually going backwards for you. So the system doesn't want you to get there. But see, you weren't that terrified. You dealt with it. Uh, it exhausted you, of course, because that's just kind of the way it had to work out. You know, it, uh, you didn't have the confidence just to say, be gone. Yeah. Or the confidence to walk up and say, hey, how you doing? What's your name? I'm George. You know, I'm Mike. Where do you live? What's your neighborhood like? You know, or just walk up and give it a hug. Who you look, you look kind of bad and scary, but I'm going to give you a big hug because I love you too. You know, if you did that, poof, it'd have been gone just like that. But you didn't, you fought with it. You had to force it out. You had to use force to get rid of it. And it took your last ounce of energy, but there was enough confidence in you, rather than terror, that you could do that. You see, so you passed a fear test. And you may get another fear test and another fear test. And eventually you realize, you know, young males tend to spend a lot of time in the non-physical, in martial arts, you know, in all kinds of fighting and struggling and dealing with the negative entities and saving the world and doing all the things that are in young men's minds. So that's just what, <laughs> that's just what they find and that's what they do. And eventually that too shall pass <laughs> and you won't have a lot of that. So that's one kind of negative entities that you run into and that's most of it. There's another, which is perhaps just some other IUOC who is being negative, who is trying to use their intent to give you a problem for one reason or another. And now that's different. You see, that's a different kind of thing. That's not something you manufacture. That's something that is there and it is uh, negative and it is maybe trying to do you harm. So that's the, that's the voodoo guy someplace else trying to, uh, you know, uh, some do would harm. Call them, some or, would call them the archons. Yeah. Or it's a, or it's <laughs> one of your employees trying to encourage you to give, you know, to give one a, you know, a raise other than the others, you know, so there, there will be things that will, from other IUOCs, individual oh. use of consciousness that will be coming to manipulate you one way or another, for any number of reasons. So that's a different thing than the things that are, you know, than the things you see, like Bob Monroe, you know, the most of what he saw and described were things that he got in a data stream from the LCS. And they were there for his own growth and learning. And he came here to write that book. That's why he wrote the book. And that's why it, hap it happened to him. And he wrote the book like it was a diary. He wasn't trying to give it purpose or meaning or, the you know, or theology or explanation. He just said, hey, this is what happened to me. You know, and uh, that's what made it credible. So millions of people got a bigger idea of a bigger reality because of Bob's book. And that was the whole point. That was part of the, you know, we're, we're softening up the, you know, the human race to m make this big decision when that ball starts rolling down that hill, you know, so, so anything well, that opens minds is good. So Go ahead, uh, where would you say psychedelics come to play with people like to maybe use, uh, you know, that to accelerate out of body experiences and things. Um, and, and of course, what Mike's describing, you know, is, uh, you know, frequently experienced by people having so called bad trips, they just aren't ready mm -hmm. to go into that realm in the first place. But uh, those are becoming popular again, in certain circles, ayahuasca and that sort of thing. So what mm -hmm. are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on that are that if one uses that, once or twice, 
in order to blast themselves into the larger system. And it will do that. It is blasting you into the larger system. And you are, you know, the reality you end up in is as valid its information as any other reality. You know, again, nothing more real than information. So the information you get there is real. But if you use it as a mind opener, it tends to work out pretty good for the people who use it that way. If it becomes something that you have to keep doing, in other words, that's the only way you get there is by taking the, the, the drug, that usually turns out to be a bad thing and a negative for that individual. And I've known a fair number of people have done it both ways. So that's just a general, you know, it's just a general rule of thumb. It doesn't mean there aren't exceptions on both sides, but that's a general rule of thumb. And the reason for that is you don't evolve, you don't grow up because you've had an experience. Experience doesn't grow you up. So you can get blasted into the great beyond with uh, what was a drug of choice some years back, uh, one ayahuasca, but it was, um, well, I don't know, it doesn't come to me now, but you could, you can go there. And if it's just, wow, gee whiz, like, this uh, is DMT. DMT. Yeah, that's it. So if it was, if you get some DMT and you go out there and wow, quite a trip. I saw this, I saw that. And uh, you'll get information. Often you'll get good information while you're there. But if it's a, an experience, then put that in the same category as getting on a really good roller coaster. It's an experience. Whoa, you know, and your hands up in the air. Wow, it's an experience. But it doesn't make you grow up. You don't grow up from experiences. You grow up from making good choices. When you make good choices, that's how you grow up. You are, you know, your actions, you're doing it. It's you, it's your intention. And just having, a, having an experience won't help you grow up. And the problem is that people have those experiences. They feel like they're awesome, life-changing experiences. And matter of fact, the guy that wrote the DMT um, uh, magic molecule, I don't know, he did a book on DMT. He put a lot of people through his, his process. Uh, DMT. Terrence McKenna? No, no. Um, this, was a, yeah. this was a psychologist, psychiatrist, yeah. and he put up a lot of people through it. He said BMT, the something molecule, I believe. Yeah. Anyway, he wrote a book about that. Well, he put dozens of people through this, but he had clinical settings, right? So he gave them a measured amount. They were in a bed. They were, uh, you know, they were monitored. Their vital statistics were all monitored. Then they Rick got Stras uh, Rick Strassman. Strassman. Yes, yeah, Strassman. That's the guy. And so he interviewed them before. He interviewed them afterwards. He gave them psychological tests. So it was more of a clinical research environment. And most of these people all had what they described as life-changing viewpoints, life-changing experiences, sort of like the NDEs near-death experience people often have life-changing experiences. Mm -hmm. And afterward, I think it was a year later or something, he went back to all the same people and interviewed and retested and so on. And his conclusion was that most of them weren't all that different than they were before they started his program. There really wasn't any obvious growth going on there. You know, they, they weren't different people who saw the world in a different way. They were pretty much the same people and saw the world in the same way they did before. So it wasn't a growth experience, even though they described it as totally changing. Well, it was an experience. It was a, a peak experience, a mind-blowing experience, but that doesn't make you grow up. You become love by making good choices, by caring about people and acting like you care well, I shouldn't say acting. It's not acting. It's being, you know, it's not that you should act kind. You need to be kind. And that being is translated in, in what you do, the choices you make and how you make them, your intentions. And that's what grows you up. So the drugs are an experience, but they aren't going to help you grow up in and of themselves, but they will show you things. But, you know, it's uh so I don't recommend it really as a, as a, you know, as a way of 
of learning or, or spiritual growth, because I don't think it gives you spiritual growth. Most of the yeah. guys that I've seen, they'll do the drug once or twice. The, the ones I've seen that actually have done well with the drugs, they do it once or twice, and then they go on the internet to say, what's going on here? And they become seekers and they start to learn and grow without the drugs. And the, the drug just woke them up. That seems to have been a good arrangement. But the ones that, it doesn't just wake them up, but they, they want another experience. And they want another one. And they can yeah. hardly wait to that next big, awesome experience. So they take the drug again, and they take the drug again. I talk to them a year or two later, and I find them that they've drifted into negativity, mostly because their experiences went from positive in the beginning and awesome to something a little darker after a while. And they're starting to see dark things and they're starting to interact with stuff and they're given plans and things they're supposed to do and places they're supposed to go. And this whole, this thing develops and generally it's very dysfunctional and they get a little paranoid and other things. So that's what I've seen. Yeah, I've I've observed that same exact thing over the years. Uh, people tend to uh, just fall into it as a crutch. And like you say, rather than a life-changing experience, it sends them down a different road. They think drugs are the answer. And, right. and after a while, uh, a lot of them I've seen, uh, you know, reach that point of no return. Absolutely. Well, they're convinced in their own mind that they are more spiritual, more understanding, that their understanding is greater than other people. So they, they, their ego immediately starts to grow. Well, that is not a sign of growing up. That's a sign of de-evolution. And they feel superior in that, well, I know, and you, you guys who haven't done this, you just don't understand. Then they tend to just hang out with other people who do the drugs. Mm -hmm. their, their associations tend to be people who do drugs. They all pat each other on the back, telling each other how, how spiritual they are. And yeah, the whole thing just de-evolves into something that's not very pretty. And they get to the point that uh, they have trouble holding their job. They have trouble staying focused. Uh, their minds tend to be scattered. So, you know, they lose their, you know, they lose their job. They do this, they do that. And pretty soon they're just like most other druggies. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're kind of on a dead end path that is taking them more and more into dysfunction so yeah, I, yeah you know what it is it's like this all this this trend is don't take shortcuts like Absolutely. don't don't try to manipulate your boss to get a raise work to get the raise don't try to take drugs to, to expand your consciousness work to expand your consciousness because that's what consciousness is it's doing the work your self-improvement getting in touch with yourself and, and love and everyone around you and building that holistic mindset, right. Of everything connected. Yeah. That's what health is. That's what we always talk about health people. Same with the health world. Oh, I've got a symptom. Let's go to the doctor to give me some external thing to fix myself instead of me looking internally to see mm -hmm. what's causing that. Stop taking shortcuts people the biohacking <laughs> thing drives me crazy because it's like i'm gonna hack my consciousness and there's i just saw this new <laughs> conference where they're talking about this thing to help you meditate where you just put headphones on and it takes all the work away you can get right to a med meditative state without having to do any of the work i mean i literally just got yeah. an email about this yesterday i'm like yeah. that is not that's why we talk about martial arts we talk about meditation we talk about breath work we talk yeah. about yoga it's like there are really cool things you can do that are a practice. Mm -hmm. It's like playing piano, right? You can't just jump right. on the piano and become, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. you know, get all the ladies right away, as you say. But um, one thing that, that interests me, Bob, uh, 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 is about your book where you, when you're when you're younger, Tom, and um, there's the guys in the in the, the non-physical form that have the book. They say you're not supposed to be here anymore. We're kicking you out. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. And those who read the big toe book will know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Have you figured out yet what they knew? Was this where you are now? Cause you were supposed to be here to tell the world about mm -hmm. this. And have you figured out why they kicked you out and what they knew when they were looking at their, their little notebook? Yeah, I figured out some of it, you know, um, it's hard when you're looking upstream to figure things out. You know, if you're, if you're in a, in a job or a situation, you can look down, you know, you can look down, down the hierarchy, 
down to the mail room and you can kind of understand everybody that's there and what they're doing and why they're doing it because you've been there, you've, you've worked up through all that stuff. But when you start to look up and say, no, what are those executives thinking about? What's the CEO, you know, what's he have on his mind? That's a lot harder because you've not been there and you're just not in that space. So you guess, you say, well, it's probably the same thing I have on my mind. And you think everybody's just like you and you make a lot of bad choices that way, but you really don't know. So looking upstream is a tough, is a tough thing. It, it, it's easy to make assumptions, but I think I've come to some conclusions about it, but they're not, they're not fixed. You know, I, you know, I was sort of, uh, you know, picked for this job, like, like Bob Monroe was picked for his job. And in the non-physical at that time, and still is, you know, there's a fair amount of, of uh, what should we say, uh, argument about which way to go. I mean, everybody knows what the goal is, but there's always a lot of ways to get to that goal. And there's some people who would say, well, the best way is just, you know, like the pacifists, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't join them. You got to rise above them. So if they're going to come and, you know, do something to you, well, you just, you don't be violent. You let that happen. You just back off because otherwise you're being just like them. So you have that viewpoint. And then you have another viewpoint that says, no, that's crazy. You know, if somebody comes and pushes you, then you have an obligation to push back because that's, that's evil there that's trying to overwhelm your free will. And that's wrong. And to just let wrong things happen is not part of the solution. It's part of the problem. You say, so there's different entities have different attitudes about the way things should progress. And that means that in the non-physical, in the realm of where, you know, where choices are being made and they're trying to uh, help us evolve, there's a such a thing as politics. <laughs> politics just means differences of opinions about how to do something, you know, that creates politics. So there was politics there at that time. And at that time, when I, that was back in, geez, I was very young then, seven years old or something. Um, the, uh, the management structure was different than it is now and had different opinions. And there were those that agreed with management and those that disagreed with management. And the group that was teaching me and that I was a part of disagreed with management at that point. So that's what the that's kind of what the what the process was all about. So yes, there's politics everywhere because there's always multiple ways to solve a problem. And people get into those, you know, ways and they, they struggle then with each other because decisions have to be made, choices have to be made. You're gonna do things or not do things, and which way do you do? You know, do you do it the way A wants or the way B wants? So struggle and politics is not just here, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what that those things were all about. And, you know, I was being groomed from a very young age, like I say, I was like six or seven, when I was doing those out of body things as a young child. And I was being taught. And when I was out of body, I was like 20 something, you know, I was an adult, young adult. And then I'd go back in and I was like six years old and a child. And that was just an amazing transformation, you know, that you went from being aware and, you know, kind of in charge of things to, you know, to being small and totally dependent on everybody, you know, for, for everything important. So it, uh, but I was being taught, I was being groomed for, for some, you know, position, some work to do. And I was definitely on side B, not on side A. So uh, that politics changed. And now, uh, now the, uh, that side actually uh, um, kind of ran into trouble. And that was more the pacifist side, actually, they kind of ran into trouble, it didn't work out too well for them, as you might guess, you know, being a pacifist is not really a good long term idea, unless you're, you're rooting for the bad guys, you know, it's, it's good for them. But it's not really, there's a time where you need to fight back. There's a time when you need to, you know, stand up and say no. And there's a time to turn the other cheek and, you know, let things go. But you have to know the difference. And you have to have good reasons. You're not doing it for your ego, for your beliefs. You got to do it because it's right, because it's low entropy. 
because it's the best thing to do for everybody. And anyway, so now the, the crowd that was not in favor of that uh, uh, you know, turn the cheek is in charge and has been for some about 30 years now. And that made everything different. But that was where the politics were then. And That's that was probably that was probably a time when the politics were at a, a peak. You know, politics, sometimes everybody sort of agrees and, and the differences are kind of minor. They're kind of picky, but sometimes the politics are really, you know, polarized and the differences are huge. And at that time, it was more polarized, which was why I got jerked into that uh, court situation, if you say. That was because that was the struggle of A, of a versus B, and I was just caught in it. So, so. so now the, uh, the, the forces that are the, poli- the main body politic of that non-physical uh, world are, are more in terms of action and, and proact- proactive yes. growth. That makes Abs- sense seeing where we are right now in the world. Absolutely. That switch took place about a year or two before the Berlin Wall came down. Fascinating. Yeah, I remember telling some guy who was here from Poland, actually. He had, uh, I think he was from Poland. He had jumped ship. And that was back when Poland was part of the, the USSR. And he had jumped ship in Texas, in the Gulf, and swam to shore, got political asylum. He still had a wife and, and, and child back in Poland. And I was talking to him, and he did get his wife and child to come visit him. And while they were here, I told him that uh, they should look for in the near change, all that changing. You know, and they looked at me and said, no, that's just the way it is. It's been that way for, you know, for 50 years, and it, that's not going to change. And uh, because the, 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 uh, management just had turned over and I knew it was a whole new attitude going on. Mm-hmm. So uh, sure enough, within, uh, within a couple of years, the wall came down. Uh, Nelson Mandela kind of broke the back of, of uh, apartheid in South Africa. And what did we had? Uh, Czechoslovakia broke out a, a spring, you know, what do they call it? Uh, I can't remember that back in the seventies, you remember that bear? Back when, uh, you know, in the 70s, when the lots, of, lots of good things were breaking out all over, people around the world seemed to have this idea that, that peace is the answer, not war. And uh, anyway, so all of that uh, kind of was taking place shortly after that. And that was just because the, the force that was holding what I call the positive side back from acting because the dominant force was not to act, was just let it happen however it happened. But the negative side never lets it happen however it happens. They always cheat, you know, because that's what negative side means. <laughs> They're not yeah. all about love. They're all about ego and getting what they want. And the, the other side cheats. And if the side that doesn't cheat just lets everything happen and lets the negative kind of cheat and get away with it because we wouldn't want to, you know, lower ourselves to that level, then everything starts to go bad. And that's where it was. And it was on a knife edge of getting to the point where if it went much further, it would just slip slide down that negative space. And that's where we were back then. And that's when hence, hence World War One, World War Two, the Vietnam War. I mean, that makes yeah. sense. It reflects the physical yes. reality. So that's that was where we were. It was real close to that knife edge of no of, of the point of no return. If the negativity gets this much of a hold, then it's just going to snowball. You know, you're gonna have this big downward spiral and it's all gonna be negative, it won't stop till you hit the bottom. Then you have to work your way back out of it. So just before it got to that point of no return, things changed. And that was a purposeful thing. It was the change was made because the inevitability was seen, you know, the probable future was seen as as going backwards, not forwards. So the there was a change and that change then created a lot of other changes. You know, we have perestroika, right? And the Soviet Union, you know, followed that a few years later where they kind of change things. Well, a lot of that change has kind of <laughs> slip slide, it's been slip sliding away recently. But then I see that as we're poised on this edge to really take some big steps forward in being caring. 
And I think the forces that would that are opposed to that, they're still locked into control power force. They see that trend. They see that coming and they are pulling out all the stops, kind of the last big hurrah, I guess, for the control power and force guys. They're doing their best to dominate and control and whatever, you know, pulling out all the stops to do as much as they can. And I just think they're going to fail, you know, because that's not where this wave is taking us. You know, the things that... And, uh, well, I was just, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to say the greatest level of mastery is be able to draw your line in the sand and even back it up with force if necessary. But the motive is love. You know, you're doing it to preserve beauty, to preserve harmony, to preserve uh, the free will of all of life everywhere. So um, even if it takes physical force, you know, it, it's not done out of anger or out of fear. So once again, the love force comes in. It's kind right. of the old Aikido principle, right? Absolutely. It's, you know, I, I look at it, of course, in terms of uh, entropy. Can't help that. I'm a physicist, but that just comes with, <laughs> comes with the territory. But I look at it in terms of entropy. You make choices that will result in the lowest entropy for for yourself and others for the whole system. So if by defeating evil, you're going to lower entropy, you're going to make things better for, you know, for everybody, then that violence is required. It's not, you know, it's not only optional, but you need to step into that, you know, you need to step up to that line in the sand and hold it as best you can. So that's, you know, because that's the low entropy solution. Now, if you're doing it right out of fear, you're doing it out of ego. Oh, I want to win this because then I'll be in charge, you know, and I'll be the big guy and I'll be able to tell everybody what to do. Well, that's not the right reason. That's, that's another high entropy solution. So you have, and all your choices are like that. All life's choices, you know, should I do this or that? Should I, you know, what choices should I make? Well, your choices should always be made to, to minimize the entropy for yourself and others, for you and the system. Long term, not short term, but long term. And if that's what you're trying to do, then go ahead and do it. And if it turns out you were wrong, well, learn from it. Do better next time. But yeah. that's just the way life works. That's how people grow up is they, they try to compute what's the right thing to do for low entropy. They do it. Then they look at it. They study it. And say, how did that come out? Was that good for most everybody or not? And if the answer is not, then learn from it. How is it you made the wrong choice? How is it you misunderstood the possibilities? And then you don't make that again. So it's never a problem making a mistake. It's only a problem not learning from the mistakes that you make. Well, it's so. like you say, taste the pudding. If the pudding's too salty, then redo it. If it's too sweet, redo it until you get that perfect right. pudding. Right. So <laughs> you got to learn. You got to learn from your from your mistakes. Some people get so bound up with the idea that they don't know the perfect choice. They don't know the right choice. So they can't make any choice. So now they're stuck. You know, they, they, they can't do anything. So it's that is not helpful. Make the best choice you can. And it should be with a lot of thought, some meditation, you know, some intuition, make your choice and then see what happens. See how those chips fall and learn. That's so there's no penalty. If you say, well, I think this will be the low entropy and it turns out unforeseen consequences. Oh, I created a mess there and I really didn't mean to. Well, Okay, that's not a big decrement for making the choice if you try to make it for the right reasons, but learn from it. If you make that same choice again, the decrement will be a little bigger. <laughs> and then if you make it a third time, it'll be even bigger. You know, you need to, you need to learn. So life is really and it a, might be a, game. a good time for uh, might be a good time for us to all start listening to the elders of our culture because maybe we can learn from their experience and. Uh, I've sure uh, enjoyed this conversation with you today, Tom. Uh, uh, you know, just such a valuable voice, especially with what's going on in the world today. Yeah. Well, and for I, me, it, for me, this has been like a visit with family. You know, it's uh, <laughs> you know, like I say, you know, you and I come from from similar roots, right? We we uh, grew up at a 
at a time that was very expansive. And uh, yeah. We're going back there though. I feel yes, it. Yes, I think I so too. It. We're coming up to a time that's going to be very expansive. I mean, I see good signs. I see signs of us growing up and learning. You know, just this, what, last year this time, you know, we had COVID just getting started in, in China. And years before that, we've always had flus and other illnesses come around. Matter of fact, we had one back in the early, nine, late 19, or what, before 1920, 1917, 18, 19, in that, in that range, killed 20 million people at a minimum. I mean, really severe. And what did we do about it? Well, mostly nothing. You know, life went on as usual. Yeah, okay, that's life. People get sick, some of them die. It's, you got to go on with life. That was the idea. And that's been the idea with every flu that's gone through here until, or every illness that's gone through until this past year. This past year, we got a flu and says, well, it's a little more contagious than usual. And it's a little more deadly than usual. And instead of us all shrug and say, yeah, well, you know, that's life, you know, stuff like that happens and <laughs> old people die and it's just, you know, life goes on. You know, that's just the way nature is. People didn't say that. They said, hey, we can do something about it. We can wear masks. We can distance. Well, at least some of us did. You know, we can, we can not, uh, we can be part of the solution here because they cared enough to want to do that. So I saw that as a good sign. People trying to help not spread the virus because anybody who does math knows about exponential growth and you know in a in a susceptible population which we all are because this is something new that is an exponential thing you know it gets out of control very easily and once it gets out of control then services are swamped and then a lot of people get hurt so hey let's keep this thing under control we'll weather it but we'll weather it better if we all help. So I looked at that and said, hey, for the first time, people have decided to actually take action and be responsible for at least trying to slow this thing down. Now, how successful they're going to be, I don't know, but they've, I think you can be pretty successful slowing it down. It may eventually run through and through and through till we all end up having it one way or another, but that's all right if that's slow. So I think that was a good thing. And like, you, like we said before, there's, there's lots of people now who are pushing on kindness, caring. It's about other. You know, that, I see that a lot. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a new thing. And yeah, I think maybe like back in the 70s, you know, when everything was opening up and uh, consciousness was expanding, we don't have to just go to war because that's what the government says. You know, here's my here's my draft card. You know, I don't want it anymore. I I don't uh, I don't want to play that game because I think it's wrong. You know, well that wasn't that wasn't a possibility before, but in the '70s it was a possibility, a way to to uh, exert your own free will in the system, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So yeah. I'm seeing I'm seeing more and more and more of that now. And uh, and then I you know I see a, a, a time when we have the technologies, knowing that um, there is uh, the consciousness uh, concept can go beyond the physical. That we can literally extend that into our own body, see where we might have some sort of physical malady, and repair them with our consciousness. Oh sure. And, and have you ever, we, we, we're going to wrap it up because we're coming on two hours here. We want to respect your time. But have you ever had that kind of experience, Tom? Oh, yeah. You can heal all sorts of things with your mind. Mental healing is a, is, is a very real thing. It's just a little more purposeful uh, version of uh, the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. You know, the placebo effect says get somebody to think positively about their illness and it'll help their illness go away. Well, instead of just thinking positively about it, you can actually focus your intent on accomplishing that. And it's, it's a whole lot stronger than the placebo effect. Sure, that is the result of your, your intent modifies future probability. The future probability of being healthier rather than sicker, you can change that probability. And yes, I've done that a lot. You know, I've done that in some rather dramatic cases. It's... Uh, Again, it all works out of that intuitive side, you see, yeah. 
If you can get to that intuitive side, get your intellect to be quiet because your intellect just wants to make a wish. Oh, I wish that person was healthier. That's what your logic is. That doesn't help. That doesn't work. You got to get rid of the noise. You got to get intuitive. It's got to come. Some people would say from the heart, but it has to come from the core of you. And it has to be focused and it has to be clear and it needs to happen in an intuitive space. And if it does, healing is one of the easiest things that we can do of all the paranormal things. Healing is about the simplest. And that's because our ability to affect things depends on the natural uncertainty of what we're trying to affect. And because biology is so, you know, we know so little about it, you know, doctors are guessing most of the time about what's wrong with somebody, you know, we know so little about it, that there's lots of uncertainty. I mean, number thousands of people have been in stage four cancer going to die in three months, and they don't have cancer anymore. And that was, you know, 30 years ago, it happens, there's lots of uncertainty there, where there's uncertainty, then you can use your intent to modify probability, it's easier. You see, where there's very little uncertainty, well, it's very hard to modify intent with your probability. So it's not just get anything you want. You're manipulating probabilities with your intent. So healing is, a, is an easy thing to do. And one of the places that I'll tell you, I, I said I was going to give you some places for details. In my, in my YouTube channel, which I guess is probably easy to find if you start with Google and go to me or my big toe or something like that, go to my YouTube channel and look for um, a, well, I think it was called an immersive that I did in TMI, that's the Monroe Institute. I just used their facility basically and uh, TMI supported it. Uh, I did it uh, last year and I think in maybe August, but look, just search the titles for TMI, you'll get several and then take the latest one, which I think was last August. And in that immersive, I tell people how to communicate, how to get into point consciousness, how to heal, how to remote view, how to get data out of the databases. We go through all of these things and I instruct them like things to do, things not to do, what gets in the way, what helps. Then they go try it, they go listen. I give them a binaural beat. That may be one of the things that Mike was talking about that uh, helps you uh, meditate without having to learn how. I give them a binaural beat because if they're not good meditators, that will tend to put them in a good uh, meditation state and help them stay there. So it makes them a little better than they would be otherwise without it, which gives them a boost. But as I always tell them, it's just a tool. You got to learn to let the tool go. You need to do it on your own, but use it as you need it. So anyway, uh, you could go there. The binaural beats are available at mbtevents.com. And they don't cost much. You get like 13 of them for $25 or something. They're pretty cheap. So you could listen to that. And when I say, okay, everybody go listen to, listen to binaural beat one, you can listen to it. Come back. You hear all the discussion about it. Go back. You can take the whole course for free. I think the course cost about $2,500 to take it at TMI. And you can do really the whole thing free of charge just by going through it. The only difference that you won't have that the people there had is that you won't be able to ask your own personal question. But most people will ask, most people find their questions are answered because there's like 40 people, 50 people there. They're all having experiences. Some of them are old timers. Some of them are just new to this. There's all sorts and they all have questions and they all ask them. So it's a high probability your questions will be answered by the questions that are asked by the group. So that would be the place to get the details if you really want to know how to do these things uh, in detail. And it's, it's pretty, well, the, 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 the video is free on YouTube. The, 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 if you're already a good meditator, you don't need to buy gnarl beats. <laughs> Leave those alone. You know, they're, they're irrelevant to the process. Um, well, and we know binaural beats have been used, like we had Sherry Edwards on, uh, uh, to do healing and all sorts of things. There's a lot of different yeah. things you can you yeah. can use with with that technology. Uh, but uh, so in the show notes, Tom, I will uh, I will put down the uh, links to your YouTube channel, your website, and all that, so people can find that easier. And uh, I highly recommend reading Tom's trilogy. 
Uh, it's a fantastic read. You, you make it very easy for the layman to read. It's not like a thick scientific journal type read. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a fun read that you designed in that way specifically. There's a lot of humor in it. There's some great stories from your life in it. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic, I'm only read the first book, but so far I'm loving it. So great job on that. And I uh, highly recommend it. It's actually in our book list. So if you go to alphabetic.com forward slash book list, uh, you can find it there and it helps us out if you buy it through there and it helps Tom out, of course. So please um, uh, do that. And uh, Tom, thank you so much for today. This has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, any parting words to our community? Well, parting words would be, Love is the answer. <laughs> it's all about growing up. That's the purpose that you're here. Um, the science is nice, but that's not really the main thing. The main thing is you growing up, you making the right choices and making those right choices for the right reasons. That's what's important. And if you don't do anything else but that, that is your optimal contribution to saving not only yourself, but the world too. That's the that's the idea, you know, we, we, we look at the, like the evil politician and the bad CEO and all these things and we think if we could change them, that would fix things. Those are symptoms. Those are symptoms, they're not the problem. The problem is a low quality of consciousness. That's the problem. And we can only fix that in ourselves. You can't change anybody else. So if you want to make the optimal change to this world, if you want to make this world a kinder, gentler place, then your optimal contribution is to get rid of your own fear, get rid of your ego, get rid of your beliefs, become love. That's your optimal way for you to change the world. So you save yourself and the world all at the same time. And you're the only person that can do that. You're the only person that can change you. So, um, you know, step up to that responsibility. So I guess that's the end thing, you know, love is the answer. It's where we're going. Everything else, uh, er everything else is not as important as that. I love it. Fairlando. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> no, I uh, can't put anything any better, but just thanks again, Tom. And uh, we hope to see you again someday there. Yeah, well, it's been fun. Yes, yeah, sort of like hanging out on the back porch with family. You know, it's, uh, it is. <laughs> it's been, it's been uh, a lot of fun. Well, thanks again, Tom, and everybody for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for Cheryl Bailey, who's in our community, for connecting us with Tom's people. And Tom, we appreciate you. And uh, we appreciate everybody in our community. And I hope you enjoyed this talk. If you did, please give us a like, a thumbs up, a subscribe, wherever you're listening or following this. Please share with your friends. This is important information to get out to people. It's self-empowering. It's it, it really is connecting to everything we talk about here, which is really doing the work yourself. And that's how, if you want to see the world change, look in the mirror. And uh, also it helps to get outside, get in nature, because nature shows us the way too. So get your feet in the sand and the grass, go grow something, go for a nature hike, uh, and you know, put down the devices here and there so you can have some silence and oneness and get out of your intellect a little bit. All these things we talk about all the time, Tom, in every one of our podcasts. So <laughs> It's uh, it all connects. So thank you guys. Love you. Have a beautiful day and we'll see you next time. Cheers.